I'm not great at French, but I'm guessing that most of you don't speak French, so apart from Dorian, who might judge me on my French, I might get away with it. <laughs> oh, okay, Charlie, you can judge me as well. <laughs> Feel free, give me marks out of 10 at the end. Later, not publicly. <laughs> so it's Apocalypse set, um, verse, verse, verse 9 et 10. Après cela, je regarde encore, je vois une très grande foule. Ce sont des gens de tous les pays, de toutes les tribus, de tous les peuples et de toutes les langues. Personne ne peut, ne peut les compter. Ils sont debout devant la siège du roi et devant l'agneau. Ils portent des vêtements blancs et ils tiennent une palme à la main. Ils crient d'une voix forte. Notre Dieu qui est assis sur le siège royal et l'agneau, ce sont eux qui nous sauvent. Amen. Bien fait, très bien, très bien. Non, je commence à lire Apocalypse chapitre 7, versets 9 et 10. Après cela, après cela, je gardais et l'eau. Il y avait une grande foule que personne pouvait compter de toutes les nations, toutes les tribus et tous les peuples et de toutes les langues. Ils étaient debout devant le trône et devant l'oignon. Elles vestues d'oeuvres des robes blanches et des palmes dans leurs mains. Et ils criaient d'une haute voix, disant le salut chez notre bon Dieu qui est assis sur le trône et à l'agneau. Amen. Amen. Uh, et encore, on a dit pour les gens qui ne comprennent pas, uh, I'll say it in English once more for those that don't understand Guernsey French or French or the other languages. We had the English right at the start, but let's be absolutely certain about these verses because they're key for us today if we're going to understand what God wants to say to us. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. Amen. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, or s sometimes people say it's the birthday of the church. And I want to say just right at the start, because I've got a bit of a, a thing about the word church. The building we're in is not a church. Okay? It's the church center. Yeah? Where is the church? Point to the church. Yeah. All right? The building itself is not nothing holy, nothing special. In fact, we coped for many years without a building that we owned. Right? The people are the special people. You are. And so, can I just encourage you, when you refer to uh, the Rock Community Church, this is the Rock Community Church Center, but you are the Rock Community Church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And he didn't mean a building made of stones. He meant his people that he was in the process of sa saving. And if we keep focused on that, I think the Lord will do something with us because we are not here permanently. We are pilgrims. We're destined somewhere else. Yeah? And even though we come from different cultures, different tribes, different nations, different backgrounds, nevertheless, God wants us to be an example here on earth of what he's all the time planned and is now bringing together for us one day around that throne that we've just read about. That's what the picture is. And I want to spend just a few moments this morning 
talking about, obviously, that the first day of Pentecost. And you can read it in Acts chapter 2. I'm not going to read it now, but I'll just recount the story for those of you who may be forgotten. But the disciples, who after Jesus' death and resurrection, had been gathering together to pray, but in an upper room, they'd been sort of behind the scenes. Some of them a bit scared, no doubt, of what might happen. If you remember, Peter had, on the eve of, of uh, Jesus' trial and, and uh, crucifixion, he'd even denied Jesus. But Jesus had given them a promise, and they remembered that promise, and that was that after a time, while they got gathered together, well, they were to wait until the Holy Spirit will come upon them. Now, I don't, I'm, I don't think they really knew what that would mean. But one day, they were all together in the upper room. And a sound like a mighty rushing wind suddenly filled the room. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And some people saw like flames of fire above them. It was an incredible moment. So incredible that instead of staying in the upper room, they rushed out onto the street. Now, it was during the time of the Feast feast of Pentecost. So there were people there from all over the place, all over the known world at the time, because the Jews had been dispersed since the time of the Babylonian captivity, about 500 years or so before. Many of them didn't return to Israel, to Judea. And so they would come back for certain feasts, and particularly the Feast of Pentecost. And so there were people there from all over the place. And many of them, of course, they'd lived for centuries as families in other parts of the world. They didn't really speak Hebrew anymore. They, they might have spoken Greek because that was the sort of language that most of the Roman, Greek, Roman world spoke at that time. They might have spoken that as a language to communicate with others. But they certainly didn't speak Hebrew anymore. And when the disciples suddenly burst into the street, they started speaking in tongues. Tongues, languages that they hadn't learnt. Languages that spoke of the praise of God. They spoke of the things of God and these different languages the people could understand. Because not surprisingly, they thought, uh, these are drunkards. You know, when you, 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 I know Andre was out on street pastors last night. And where are you, Andre? I can't see you there, over there. I don't know, you, you must hear some strange language sometimes when you're on street pastors. Yeah, I mean, but people are late at night, they've been, had something to drink. They won't necessarily speak very well. And sometimes that sounds a bit odd. And it might sound like a foreign language. And some people, they just, they just said, Oh, I don't know what's going on. You know, who's that guy on, I've got ad-libbing here, who's that guy on, on Jeremy Clarkson's farm? Who, uh, Gerald. Huh? Gerald, that's right. He can't understand him. I can't understand him either. But, you know, and it, it's, it's the same language, but it, maybe they thought, it's just drunk. And then Peter has to get up. He does. So Peter, this is Peter who had only a few weeks before been too scared to associate with Jesus. He gets up and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he preaches... And says, these men are not drunk. It's only, the, it's only the beginning of the morning. The pub's not open yet. But the Spirit of God has come down and he remembers the promise. Because, and we're going to look at this in a moment. The, the pro, he, he quotes the prophet Joel. And Joel looked to a time when the Spirit of God will come upon all people. All flesh, that's what it means. Everyone. And people would, from different tribes and tongues, not just Jewish people, not just the Hebrew tongue, they would come to worship God. And on that day, first day of Pentecost, many people become followers of Jesus and get filled with the Holy Spirit. And it was the beginning of the church in the sense that, because there's always been believers in God, we've got the Old Testament, the church began to look like God had always intended it to. to. There were people there from all over the world who became Christians. We're preparing for heaven. I remember once uh, at a Stony Bible Week, that must be at least 25 years ago now, um, doing a youth seminar. And we were doing it on missions. And uh, somebody came forward at the end for prayer. I said, if you're feeling called to mission, but you've got some issues and things, we'll pray for you. And I said, what can I pray for? And this particular individual young person said, can you pray for me? I feel called to China, but I don't like rice. (laughs) 
So I didn't pray for them. I said, go away and learn to like rice. Because when you get to heaven, I think we're going to be eating a lot of it because there's more Christians in China today, and there will be by the end of the, end of the time we, we get there, than there are probably in anywhere else in, in the world. I said that just as a joke. But the fact is, God loves all sorts of people. And his gospel is for the whole world. That's why we sent Corinne and Guillaume to France. That's why God is in the process of bringing people here. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. I mean, 20 years ago, all right, there was only white Caucasians here in, in Guernsey, really. And I remember praying for God, will you just bring some people from the nations here? And bit by bit, we've seen that. And thank the Lord that you're here. You've been sent here. You might have got a job here if you've come from other nations. You might have married somebody here. But God has a purpose for you because he's building his church the way he intends. As Tiosi said right at the beginning, we don't have, uh, we shouldn't have churches for this group of people and churches for that group of people. You know, we don't have churches for farmers and churches for accountants. That, that's not, we don't have, have, we shouldn't have churches for Nigerians and churches for Guernsey people. That isn't the way God intended. He wants us to be together, focused not on one another so much, but on him. Because that's the picture that we get in Revelation. That's the vision that John saw. And to a certain degree, it's the redemption of something that had been lost. Now, we're not there yet, but I wanted to just paint that picture, that story, to you this morning. Because in Genesis chapter 11, we read about the story of the Tower of Babel, right? And right at the beginning, even before that, if you read the accounts of creation in the first part of Genesis, you'll see that God had an intention for you and me, for human beings, to, to multiply, to flourish, and to fill the earth with people who loved and walked and related to him, had a relationship with him. He, plant, he put Adam and Eve in a garden. Now, the whole earth wasn't the garden, just that bit. God had made this little garden, and he said, Go and tend the garden and then go forth and multiply. Now, if they had been completely obedient to that, they'd have gardened the rest of the wilderness and the desert and the rest of the earth and populated it with their descendants forever. The descendants who, like Adam and Eve, would have been able to relate to God personally, to walk with him in the shade of the day, to have a personal relationship. That was God's intention. And to live in a creative environment where they were tending the place and turning it into something beautiful and something ordered and something where people could live at peace and nature could be as intended by God. You with me? But that that was all broken. Because the first humans sinned. And God had to exclude them from his garden. And so they went into the earth, they did multiply, they did flourish in that sense, but they lost their relationship with God because of sin. It was broken. And everywhere they went, they took this broken relationship and they multiplied that into their descendants. That's you and I. That's that's us. We have inherited that nature of sin and just as you don't, if you've got, if your parents, you've got children, you know, you don't need to teach your children to be naughty, do you? Somehow, they learn it all by themselves. Yeah? And sin is simply not having a relationship with God. It's being, having that broken. In a sense, you don't need to do anything that others notice to be sinful. You just need to be selfish. And show me a toddler that isn't selfish. Right? Now, there's worse sins, of course. I'm not trying to make it, I'm trying to make the point that we're broken. That was not how God intended. And we, have, we haven't created gardens everywhere. Beautiful gardens where peace and where love and joy and people get on with each other. Quite the opposite. We've tried to build and create the world in our image. We've tried to be God. We've tried to play God. And people still today are trying to play God. Maybe some of us here, you think, well, I'd like a little bit of religion in my life. I'd like a little bit of Jesus, but I want 
this part of my life to go the way that I intend it to go. You can't do that. You can't serve two masters. It's broken. Now, that got to a stage when in Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, God had to do something because they were building this tower to reach the heavens and symbolizing in a sense that actually we are masters of our own destiny. We are our own gods. We're going to build something that glorifies man. And God said, we can't let this happen because we were not designed, brothers and sisters, to be gods, to be our own gods. We were not designed to be glorifying of ourselves. We were designed to have a relationship and to glorify the one true God. That's what we were designed for. And if you try and use something for which it's not designed, it will break. If not, it will break the thing that you're trying to use it for. Yeah? And so God said, I have to do something. And so he confused their languages. This is the beginning of the different cultures and different languages because they couldn't talk to each other. They couldn't understand each other properly. Even the best translators struggle with some words and some concepts because we all see things differently. You know, I speak French, but I struggle sometimes with with fish and bird names and things because the Brits see, you know, a blue tail and the French see a red nose. And it's the same bird. Yeah? Same with fish and things like that. We, we, we have di- now, that really matters in international relations because if you get something translated wrong, you could have a, a war on your hands. Yeah? There have been wars. And so this is the beginning. And God did it so that we were not in a place, we, it's sort of saving ourselves from ourselves, where we could try and be God because that was not intended. Instead, man started fighting with each other. And so we continue today. And God still had his redemption plan in Jesus all along. Because right the way through the Old Testament from Babel, you will see that there are prophets who prophesy a day where all the nations of the world will be blessed. Where all the nations will come to God, come to worship God. Isaiah looks forward to that. Joel, we've already mentioned, speaks about the Spirit of God coming on all types of people. I meant to mention in passing a, a joke, which is, I didn't want to say anything racist, but um, in a sense, racism today is a big issue, but it's always been an issue, and it really starts here at the, at the Tower of Babel. And um, there's a joke. If you look, look at jokes in different languages, you will see, particularly if they're about other cultures and things, that sometimes they're a, they're a bit rude and bordering on the racist. But this is a funny one. I don't think it's racist, but it shows how it can go. The French, have a, they use the story of the Tower of Babel as the invention of the Dutch language. Sorry, Annalise. <laughs> you, you probably heard this one because I said it before. But their, their joke goes something like this, that the Dutch language was invented and the French were working at the top of the tower and the Dutch were working at the bottom and the Frenchmen... Uh, uh, asked a question of the, 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 the Dutchman at the bottom, but as he did so, he knocked over a bag of cement and it landed on the Dutchman's head and he answered the question and went... <laughs> and that was the invention of the Dutch language, you see. Because that, that's what it sounds like to, to the French, okay? Anyway. Um, okay, that's not too... But you can see that racism is a real problem though, right? We can laugh and there's xenophobia and all those sorts of things. That's the problem we have in the world today. Nearly every situation you've got of conflict has an element of that about it. And it's meant to say, we can't, it's meant to tell us, teach us, we can't solve our problems. We need God. We, instead of fighting with each other, we need to turn to God. And maybe, maybe we need to wrestle with him a bit because there's sometimes you say, God, why did you do that in my life? And why did that happen to me? And, and come to a place where we embrace the, our need of God because we can't be gods of our own making. It never works. It never works. And so the picture that we get at Pentecost, in a sense, is a redemption of that. The beginning of it. It's, it's, it's thousands were confused in their languages 
and they parted. And in, at the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was sent for the first time on the people there, thousands who came from different languages and cultures, who couldn't normally understand each other, heard the praises of God, heard the good news of Jesus in their own language, and they were united. And they gathered and became the first church. And that's what every church should be doing ever since. Bringing to the world a picture of how God wants us to live in harmony with each other. We're not there yet. Because as you read through the book of Acts, you know that problems arise. And we've gone through some problems and we will still do that. But we're going to that day which we read about in Revelation. When we'll all be before the throne of God. Our eyes fixed on this throne and on the Lamb. We'll be there to worship. We'll be there because we've laid down all the things that other people and perhaps we to begin with have, li- have been living for in this world and instead our attention and our focus is on Jesus. And brothers and sisters, as church, the only way that we can truly fulfill this prophecy and be that to the world is with the help of the Holy Spirit. I was talking to somebody uh, this week um, in, when I was in Brussels. Well, they were interested uh, in how come I was an evangelical Christian leader and asked all sorts of things. And then we moved the subject, the subject moved on to issues of conflict in Europe at the moment, the Ukrainian crisis and in the Middle East and that sort of thing. And he said to me, he said, one of the, he said, the difficulty, he said, we're living in a polarized world where people no longer relate to each other very well. He said, they're, they're in their little groups, they're in their clubs, there are certain types of uh, people, you know, certain uh, income groups will go to the golf club, other groups will go sea swimming or uh, whatever it might be. Some will do this, some will do that, but we don't relate together anymore. And I said, except in the local church. Because when you look around, I've sometimes looked around here when I've been up to preach and I thought, only in the local church would you see an ex-con sitting next to an advocate. Or would you see a, well probably not in a courtroom you might as well, but no, you get my point. Only in the local church, perhaps sitting next to an accountant or whatever, or maybe the accountant or the ex-con, I can't remember. Um, but the, the, only in the local church we have people who wouldn't meet in our normal Western culture in that sort of way. And it's the same in other parts of the world. And we've got people who deliberately, God has placed you here to help us become more of an example of this peace and this joy and this good news that Jesus wants to give to the world. That's why you're here. But we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You, you'll get tired without the Holy Spirit. You see, even the first Christians, in a sense, uh, got, got tired and had a need of the Holy Spirit because it wasn't just the day of Pentecost. A few chapters later, in chapter 4, after Peter and John you know, have been at uh, the temple and they've, they've seen the lame man healed, they realize that they've got some enemies now because they were well, nearly arrested on that occasion. Um, nearly put behind bars. They were eventually released. But they came back and they gathered together and the church prayed. And it says, as they prayed, the place where they shook, the place where they were praying shook. There was a sense of the Holy Spirit coming again. They had need, even though it probably was only a few months after Pentecost or maybe a year or so. But even then, they had need again for a filling of the Holy Spirit. Smith Wigglesworth famous early 20th century Pentecostal pioneer um, from Yorkshire, a Yorkshire plumber that couldn't even spell well. One of his catchphrases was, only believe, and he used to spell it sometimes, H-O-N-L-Y, believe. Uh, he, He was just an ordinary guy, but he would always pray 
for the Holy Spirit to come in meetings. He would pray and he'd pray and he'd pray. And some people got annoyed with him because you just pray the same prayer all the time. You're always asking for more of the Spirit. Why do you ask more of the Spirit? He said, because I leak. Now, that is very true. And in fact, we're meant to leak. We're meant to leak wherever we are, wherever we live, wherever we work, with whomever we are with. We're meant to leak the Holy Spirit of God to others. But because we leak, we need to come back to God and say, fill me again, I'm dry. In this picture in Revelation, uh, you see the crowd there, and they've got something in their hands. What have they got in their hands? Palm branches, yeah, palm branches. Um, Palm branches, well... I suppose we've got some in Guernsey, but we don't... I mean, what, 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 was it just a thing? What does it signify? Everything in Revelation has some sort of symbolic meaning. Now, it could, sim- it could symbolize what the majority of the Greek and Roman world would have seen at that time, which would have been palm branches were associated with victory. And that makes absolute sense. You'd wave palm branches at the victorious end to a war if you were on the victory side. And in a sense, it's not because they have, we as part of that group and that throng around the throne, we haven't uh, achieved the victory, but we wave our branches at the one who has, the lamb upon the throne. Maybe, maybe. But there's something else there. Because the majority of the pictures in Revelation are not from a Greek and Roman culture. They allude to Hebrew and Jewish culture. And palm branches didn't have that significance of victory in the Jewish culture, not in the same way. Palm branches were associated with the Feast of Tabernacles. It was that day at the end of the harvest normally where they celebrated the bringing in of the harvest, but they also went back and lived in tents for a while, sometimes tents made with palm branches, to remind themselves, God had instituted this feast like that, to remember that it was God that had brought them out of the wilderness where they'd lived in tents for a generation or so. And that it was him that had brought them to the promised land. That's a significance of the palm branches, the Feast of Tabernacles. And in John chapter 7, on the last day of the feast we read, Jesus says this, He stood up and cried out with a loud voice, if anyone thirsts, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He's saying we'll leak out of our hearts the Holy Spirit, rivers of living water. And John the evangelist, just to help us, explains in the next verse, now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. There was a process he had to to go through. He had to go to the cross. He had to rise again. He had to ascend, and then the Spirit will come upon us, so that Jesus is in each one of us and transforms us so that we become the body of Christ, his church, his people. You see, if somebody at that and that particular time when Jesus said those words, anyone who thirsts, come to me, they come after afterwards, say, Yeah, I'm here. What he would have said, Oh, not yet. What? I thought you said if anyone thirsts, come to me. No, not yet. There's a there's something that needs to happen. We need to we need to have the cross and the resurrection in our lives. And we need to see the Holy Spirit come upon each one of us in order for us to see the fulfillment. There's an order to it. Now, brothers and sisters, we're living in the day of the fulfillment of that. The Holy Spirit has come. We haven't got to wait any longer. Every day, certainly every Sunday, should be an opportunity for us to come. As we gather together to come to the Lord and say, I'm I'm dry, I'm thirsty. I need you, Lord. Amen? And I hope that's why you're here today. Not just because it's Pentecost Sunday, but we're here with brothers and sisters from all over and we're saying, Lord, I need 
your spirit. And so we're going to finish with a time where perhaps you want, you, you want to say that. You want to say those words to God, to Jesus, to come to him and say, I'm thirsty, Lord. I come to you. I come before your throne. Because that's why, where we see that, that we are that group of people with palm branches in our hand saying, you've brought us, you've redeemed us, you took us out and you've taken us into your land and we come before you and we need your spirit in us today until we get to that day where we're all together around the throne. We just get a glimpse of it today. But that glimpse is important. So I'm going to invite you to stand now. Please do if you can. And just to close your eyes before the band come back. Holy Spirit, we we know you're here. And we know that we need you. We, we know that we can't we can't cope without you, Lord. We can't we can't live life without you. But more than anything else, we know this world needs to see a people that are full of your spirit. A people that will speak in many languages maybe and, in, and do things differently, but nevertheless they are united in this, that they are your people because your spirit is in them. And Lord, we confess that we leak. Sometimes we leak for good reason, because we are giving to others. We are sharing the good news with others. We are demonstrating your joy and your love and your grace to others. But sometimes we just leak because we have not come to you for a long time and we've run dry and we should come to you. So this morning we come to you. And if you want to receive this morning, just raise your hands if you can where you are. I'm going to pray for you right now. If you're dry, you're thirsty. I'm raising my hands. I need you, Lord. I need your spirit. I need your power. I need your grace. I need your love. I need your peace. I need to be fruitful in my life. I feel like I've dried up in terms of fruit. Whatever it might be this morning, Lord, come upon those that are responding to you, I pray, in Jesus' name. May they find that that river is beginning to flow again in their hearts. And may they overflow to others, to the world around them, in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And if you want prayer afterwards, don't go away. If you're responding and you want prayer, you're welcome to come here. We've got a prayer team as well at the back. But don't go away. If you need help and prayer...